In this module, we're going to start looking at the devices, the field devices themselves, what gets connected to the PLC. It's kind of important to step back at this point and understand what are the devices that are in the plant, uh, on the plant floor or in the process. You know, what are the, the devices or the signals that will be coming back to the PLC? And uh, it's just important to understand kind of, you know, a little bit of a working concept of what they are and then how they operate. So we're going to start this first section on discrete input devices. So just a quick review, like we talked about um, in the last lecture, the basic components of a PLC uh, are pretty much universal. It doesn't matter which brand PLC, it doesn't matter what size PLC, if it's a mini, small, medium, or large, they're all going to have these kind of major components. They all will have a power supply, they will all have a CPU, and they will all have some sort of internal memory. Of course, the uh, the CPU, uh, you know, could be embedded in the PLC, such as like, such as like a, uh, a microcontroller, or it could be a modular CPU, like, like a large controller, such as the compact or control logics, um, and compact logics too, for that matter. Uh, power supplies are typically... Um, field selectable to be either 24 volt DC or 120 volt AC. So those are your typical two choices, at least in the United States. And then we have these two boxes, you know, coming in and coming out. So we've got our input, it's in our input modules and our outputs. And so basically what are we sensing from the plant floor or the process? And then what are we controlling as a result of uh, what we're sensing? So we'll, we'll kind of sense various inputs, then we'll, our program will kind of process all that information and we'll have our logic, you know, in there to determine uh, basically based on the logic that we program, what outputs do we turn on to control the process. So once again, a, a, a bit of a refresher perhaps, but uh, there are two types of of signals that we use in a PLC. And those are discrete signals, or another term for that is Boolean. Uh, you'll find that when we get in the programming, you know, when we, when we create a new tag in the controller, we have to kind of define what the tag type is and the term Boolean will be used. So if it's a discrete signal, uh, it'll be known as a Boolean. A discrete signal is simply a binary number or an on or an off. It's uh, very, very straightforward. It, um, so an example of a discrete signal would be like a switch. Think of a light switch at your house, right? You turn the light switch on, the light comes on. You turn the light switch off, the light goes off. It's an on or an off. Uh, there's no in-between state. Um, we're not talking a dimmer switch here. If you have a dimmer, we're talking about just this good old traditional light switch. Um, again, our typical operating voltages or control voltages that we use, at least here in the United States, is either going to be 24 volt DC or 120 volts AC. Those are our most common control voltages. Um, so our input cards can either be 24 volt DC or 120 volt AC. There are some other ones too. There's 240 volt AC, uh, there's 48 volt DC. So there definitely are other volt control voltages out there, but Again, most of what we see in the United States is either 24 volts or DC or 120 volt AC. So just to kind of, uh, and we'll talk about all these examples in a second, but some common examples are things like a switch, a relay coil, a relay contact, a light, a horn, a motor. Again, think of things that would either be on or off and uh, kind of no in-between state. The other thing will be analog signals. And as an instrumentation and control student, the analog signals are probably the things that you'll be more um, uh, familiar with or things you'll probably be working with um, more commonly. And these are things that actually have a numerical value. They can be an integer or a real slash floating point. Um, integer is just a number that has no decimal place precision behind the number, such as a number as 22. A real or floating point number will have a will have decimal place uh, decimal point precision behind it. So 22.165 will be a real or floating point. 
it's important that we'll have to kind of define those terms as we, um, you know, for programming, if it's an integer value or a real value, just because it takes up more memory space in the controller, depending. So if you want a more precise number, we'll use a real or floating point, but it will also takes up more memory in the controller. Some examples of the analog devices would be condition sensing. So things like, you know, detecting a temperature or a level, pressure or a flow. Those are all very common process oriented um, conditions, you know, detecting the, the temperature of a sensor or a temperature of a process, the level of a tank, the pressure in the, in the line, or if there's even flow in the pipe. Um, an output example of an analog device would be a control valve. So, um, you know, control valve allows you to control the percent, the percent that it's open or percentage of open. So a control valve can be 100% open or it could be 50% open or it could be 75% open, et cetera. So by controlling how, per, how much it's open allows us to control how much flow perhaps is going to be going through that, that valve. Another example could be a meter. So Again, we'll kind of keep hitting on this, but uh, just really understand that there are two types of, um, of signals that we'll, we'll be really looking at in this class. Oh, I should have said that the for analogs, our, our two most common in the United States, or not the United States, but in, in, this is not specific to uh, geography, but um, our two most common types of signals are 4 to 20 milliamp or 0 to 10 volt DC. And I'll say that majority will be four to 20 milliamp that you probably will experience, but there is a voltage type of um, analog input as well. So let's just look at uh, some other common terminology here that this will be used uh, quite extensively throughout the class. And that is contact state in the terms NC and NO. NC would stand for normally closed, and NO would refer to normally open. And what we mean by that is, is what is the contact state when it's kind of in the off position? Um, another way to think of it is if you're holding that switch in your hand, shelf state is, we'll say that as one of the term is shelf state. So if we're holding that, that in your hand, what is, you know, and it's not being activated or actuated in any way, what is the state of the contact? If the contact itself is open, then it would be a normally open contact. If the contact is closed in the shelf state, then it's what we would call a normally closed contact. <clears throat> so um, example here is normally open. Uh, this will be a kind of our switch symbol. And you can see that it is open, right? The switch has not been closed. So uh, when, it's, when it's in the off state or shelf state, uh, there's no, you know, no power, no current is going to flow through that contact, but it's open. But when I press the switch or when I press the push button down, that will close the, the contact state. So when it's off, it's off. When it's on, it's on. Again, think of the light switch. When you uh, turn on the light switch, you complete the circuit and it turns on the light. When you open the light switch, it opens the switch and turns off the light. So that, that's kind of our, our most common, um, you know, normally open is a, a pretty common, but we do have kind of the ability to, to kind of do the opposite. And that would be to use a normally closed contact. So now when the switch is um, kind of, shall we say in the off state, it's actually, the contact is actually made, it's actually gonna pass power. And only when we press the push button now, does it open and then it goes to the off state. So we will see this quite a bit. We're going to refer to this normally open and normally closed contact a lot in the programming. And there's always going to be circumstances where we might need to use opposite. We might need to use a normally closed contact for various reasons as opposed to normally open. So uh, that'll become a little more evident as we get into, into pro programming. <clears throat> but at least understand the concept of normally open and normally closed. Now, switching devices and pilot type just refers to the um, the duty as they'll say but basically you know pilot type device just means it can it, it's more industrial it can handle higher voltages and higher currents so there's electronic duty or electronic type that would handle a you know 
very small amount of current. It would not be suitable for use on a plant floor in an industrial environment. So we'll just, we use what's called pilot duty switching devices. And essentially these are push buttons, switches, and lights, indicators. So um, these are all the discrete type devices, right? I push the push button, I turn the switch on or off, um, the light will be turned on or turned off. There's various types. Um, they have uh, uh, what we call mushroom heads, typically used for e-stops. They're big giant push buttons, so you can't really miss them. Uh, we have switches, we have uh, push buttons, and we have LED indicators. For the most part, everything's kind of switched to LED indicators now. In the, in, but the, in the older equipment that you could run into, there actually is little light bulbs in here that you might have to change out at some point when they burn out. So it's also important to understand uh, electrical symbols. Or uh, So if you're reading a schematic, you can interpret the schematic. Uh, these symbols come from a ANSI slash ISA standard. ANSI stands for the American National Standards Institute, and ISA stands for the International Society of Automation. These are just kind of two bodies that um, develop standards and in this case, ANSI and ISA kind of combined together for this one. But the standard number is 5.1. It was kind of last updated in 2009, I think, is the most recent. Um, there's not much that changes in the world of symbols. So, um, you know, that that's a long time ago, but, but not much has changed. But essentially, know that if you're doing a push button, there the symbol for push button looks like this. So if it's normally open, it looks like that. If it's normally closed, it looks like that. And in some cases we have some push buttons that might, you know, when it's off, you know, this contact is made, but when it's on, this contact is made. So, so you could have some push buttons that give you two different separate contacts when you press it. Um, but we're going to kind of really just worry about these top two for the most part uh, here in this, this class. Select your switches. So a switch, switch symbol is is different and then it actually looks like a switch and it's just got the two terminals and then the line is the basically the switch blade shall we say so this is normally open switch this is normally closed switch and same thing here you could have two potential you know outputs right so kind of a common voltage comes in you've got path a or you got path b depending on if the switch is made this way and you can also have uh, multiple selectors um, such as a larger rotary switch so, you know, position A, B, C, D, E. So it allows you to kind of uh, use one switch to maybe allow for switching for multiple conditions. Uh, but once again, we're going to pretty much only focus on the standard um, kind of switch where it's really one contact that will switch. Some of the things, though, is you know, mechanically activated industrial control switches. So um, these are ones... The, 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 the real term is a, a limit switch. You'll hear them referred to as limit switches. Um, but these are usually, uh, so so the previous ones, push buttons and switches were manually operated. Uh, key distinction there, meaning that a operator, a human man or woman has to walk up and press the push button or turn the switch on or off. So that's a manual, uh, we'll call that a manual act activated or manually activated device. These are mechanically activated, meaning that um, the human's not going to come up and activate these. Something mechanical is going to activate these. So there's really a few types. There's a, um, a rotating lever. So as if something were to push against this lever, it actually will kind of rotate. And when this mechanism kind of rotates, uh, there's a contact in here that will change state. Uh, there's one here that's, that's uh, being depressed, like a plunger. So if something presses on this button, um, it'll activate a, a contact inside of that body. Uh, there's a wobble stick. So if something kind of just tips that, that little stick over, uh, the, uh, the contact will change in there. And then another, another version of the rotating lever is just a smaller arm. So you can see this one has a, an adjustable arm that can really reach out much further or get pulled in much further. This one here is just kind of a fixed, um, fixed lever arm length. Of course, all of these are very selectable. When you had to order one of these, you know this the stick length here, this arm length here, everything will be uh, configurable uh, or selectable before you purchase it. 
uh, there's a different symbol for a limit switch and it looks like this. It looks like a switch symbol, but then it has the kind of little triangle added underneath. It looks like a number four sideways. But if you see this symbol on a schematic, then you will know that that is referring to a mechanically actuated limit switch. Now, process activated industrial control switches. These are going to be at, triggered by a process variable. And when we use the term process variable or PV, you're going to instantly think about things, you know, as an instrumentation student, things that you'll, you know, would see, you know, what what kind of gets measured in, in, a, in a process. And again, the four big ones are flow, level, pressure, and temperature. Now, this is a process activated industrial control switch. So this is still a discrete device. We're not talking analog devices yet. So we're not measuring the amount of flow. We're not measuring the actual level in the tank or the actual temperature or the pressure. Instead, what these, um, what these process activated industrial control switches do is they will trigger a contact closure based on a set point. So if I were to uh, have a temperature switch and I said, okay, when the temperature gets above 100 degrees Celsius, trip the contact. That's what I'm talking about here. Um, very much like a thermostat, like you have on your air conditioner at your house, right? When you have your thermostat set for 72 degrees on air conditioner mode, when the temperature rises above 72 degrees in your house, that would tell the air conditioner to turn on. And when the temperature falls back below 72 degrees, that would tell the air conditioner to turn off. So that's what we're kind of talking about here. We're not actually measuring or we're not providing the actual temperature value. We're just simply saying, hey, if I got to the set point, change the state of the contact. So what do these things look like? A flow switch is a... Uh, is pretty um, pretty simple. Uh, it kind of goes inside of a pipe. It's typically where you know a flow is going to be in a pipe. We've got this little kind of plate right here. So as whatever it is is flowing through this pipe, be it a fluid or an air or a gas, <clears throat> this little um, this little plate will kind of get pushed. And uh, when it gets pushed, there's a contact uh, contact state or contact in, in this body that will change state. Uh, the symbol for a flow switch is this. It's a switch symbol, but with a little kind of an upside down flag, kind of like a golf flag, perhaps. But basically, um, that is a flow switch symbol. A level switch is uh, typically like a float switch. So um, you got the uh, this little kind of bubble looking thing is kind of the float. So as the liquid rises in this tank, this, this switch will just literally float up. It's buoyant, so it just kind of floats up. And when this arm kind of moves up, there's a contact that will change state inside that mechanism, and that'll send that discrete signal out. You can use a float switch, you know, kind of at the bottom of a tank, at the top of a tank, and this is simply to um, detect the level uh, of the liquid inside the tank. If it goes, you know, above this float switch, then it's too high. If it goes below this float switch, then it's too low, perhaps. The symbol for a float switch is simply a circle on a little kind of uh, arm here off the switch. So if you see the circle, that's a float switch. A pressure switch, pr pressure switch is um, essentially you're going to dial in a set point. It's going to trigger at a at a given pressure. Um, the symbol for the pressure switch is this kind of semicircle, half circle, uh, and uh, looks like a little bit like an oil can. Maybe you know, think about oil pressure is a lot of time, but basically it's a switch symbol with a little half circle. Um, when you buy this pressure switch, you're going to kind of specify what the pressure range is, you know, what PSI range is it going to operate in. There, usually you'll take that cover off and there'll be a little probably screwdriver set point in there to kind of you know, actually screw in and, and, and do the set point. So as, a, as an instrumentation technician, one of the things you'd probably do is you would hook your, your, your pressure um, tester device to the switch and you would, you know, trigger the, uh, you know, use your pressure sensor tester 
to actually you know put out a pressure onto it and then just validate that it actually trips at the right pressure set point. Uh, it can press, it, it could trip on a uh, rising pressure or it could trip on, on uh, um, falling pressure, depending on what you need to detect in the process. If you need to, if you want to detect a pressure falling, then, then the, you know, as the pressure goes below us, the set point, that's when it triggers. Or if it's pressure rising, then when the pressure goes above the set point, then that's when it triggers. So also important to understand uh, what you're trying to measure there. Last one is a temperature switch. And this one we just you know discussed a little bit earlier, but essentially, you know, we're going to say same thing as the pressure. You're going to kind of buy it at a, at a particular temperature range. You're going to use a, probably like a little screwdriver set point to um, actually dial in, you know, at what temperature do you want this thing to, to trigger at? And, uh, you know, again, it's going to be the same thing. If it's going to be going, you know, if, it, if it's rising temperature or falling temperature, you know, uh, how do you know how do you want to detect and, and uh, measure you know or send that signal to the, to the PLC you know if it's temperature is getting too high or if the temperature is getting too low all depends on what you're trying to measure in the process the symbol for a temperature switch is this kind of little squiggly looking line uh, tied underneath the switch contact so when we look at our PLC input card. So this, this is a representation of what a PLC input card could look like. We have eight inputs. Uh, we do start with zeros in a lot of cases for a lot of different manufacturers. We start with zero and not one. That's kind of a, um, uh, we'll, we'll get to why that is uh, soon, but really kind of ties to the, uh, to this, to how the microprocessors world is, is, um, it, 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 you know, some, just some computer science reasoning for that. Um, so this is actually the first input, even though it's zero, zero. And seven is our eighth input, you know, it's zero, seven. So as you can see here, we have um, eight different discrete devices getting wired into this PLC. So the PLC doesn't really know what any of this stuff is. All it knows is that I should be expecting a voltage at this terminal. If there's a voltage at this terminal, then this input is considered on. If there's no voltage at this terminal, then the input is considered off. So this push button, this is this is drawn as a normally closed push button. So under normal conditions, this is on. And then when I press this push button, this gets opened, and then there'll be no voltage at this terminal, and therefore this would be considered off. If in the PLC world, again, it doesn't know that it's a push button. It also doesn't know that it's 120 volt AC or zero volt DC. All it knows is it's on or off. And therefore that would be a zero or a one. So if 120 volts AC is present at this terminal, then it just looks, it just considers this as a one or an on in the PLC. If this push button gets pushed, there's no voltage at this terminal, then now this is considered off and that would be a zero in the PLC for this input. So you see we've got a push button, we've got the uh, level switch, we've got a limit switch, another limit switch, we've got a oil pressure switch, or a pressure switch, I should say, another pressure switch, flow switch, and a temperature switch. So this is, so when you see this sim symbology, uh, then you can you know instantly recognize uh, what it is. So from a troubleshooting standpoint, you know, Again, the PLC doesn't know that this is a limit switch per, per se, but if you had this this drawing and you're trying to figure out, you know, why is this input not coming on? Well, you get the drawing now and say, oh, it's a limit switch. And we go back and hopefully this limit switch has been labeled properly and it will allow you to kind of go back to your equipment, find that limit switch and maybe determine why the limit switch is not working. So it's just important to understand how to understand, you know, read these uh, symbols. All right, that is it for uh, this discrete section, and uh, we'll pick up in a in another in the next video. Um.